and the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 434th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> Every day I get up early, uh, primarily because I've got, um, uh, what's that thing that you can't sleep? Insomnia. I've got insomnia, so I get up early. Today I got up at 2. And uh, I was still up. <laughs> were you? <laughs> I got up at two and I sat down and just started working. And I like working with the sun coming up. I think that's a very pleasant thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I look at the, at the news on energy and climate change, put together 10 to 15 items with a synopsis and a link for each, links to the original articles and post that on my blog, geoharvey.com. And Tom and I get together and we do the best of the blog that's what you could call it. On, the th on Thursday afternoons now. It used to be Thursday mornings. Now, now, some of these stories are well worth reading. Oh, yeah. Some of them, I'll try to call your attention to them. Sometimes <laughs> I miss, but some of these things really have a lot of good information in them. Yep. I mean, and they don't originate in BCTV, but, you know, there are other smart people out there. There are smart <laughs> people in this world, and some of them do some pretty amazing things. And... You know, I didn't have our, our first opening thing up. You want to put that up, Tom? Not, push, well, you could. Yeah, go ahead. Want to push that this up? Is, this is the, the banner that we start with. But I, what I'm going to do I now... start with that. I'm just going to go to that, that picture. Oh, yeah. And that picture is for our first, um, first article that we're talking about, which came from the BBC. It did. And by the way, before I go on, I should mention that if you... Go to the go a little bit down on your screen and probably over to the right. You'll find a couple of links to the script that Tom and I use, so that you can actually link to the articles that we're talking about. So anyway, well, what you're looking at there is toothpaste. Could have fooled me, man. <laughs> and you know that thing in the lower right-hand corner, corner that says 100. Yeah. It, that, I I swear I read that as moo. TN. And when Tom came into the studio, I was looking for some explanation online of what Mu TN is. Well, see, I was looking up there where it's uh, enlarged. Yeah, and I, and I, I mentioned see it, it to you know? Tom, and Tom looking says, Looking at it on my screen. No, that's Mu M, and it means micro, micrometer. Micrometers. So it's not a micrometer, that's a tool. This is a <laughs> micrometer. So what do you got for a title? How to fight microplastic pollution with magnets. Magnets? Well, they're, okay, Fion yeah, Ferreira, Fion Ferreira, a chemistry student in Groningen University in the Netherlands, found a way to use magnets, believe it or not, to extract microplastics from water. He mixed vegetable oil with iron oxide powder, which is just rust powder. Rust, yeah. Well, actually, that's not technically true. There are many different iron oxides. Rust is an iron rust oxide. Rust is an iron oxide. And most people would look at iron oxides and say, yeah, it's rust. But technically, a, 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 a chemist might say, no, that's not actually rust. Rust is <coughs> FeO2. With um, uh, to create a magnetic liquid, which attaches to the particles, he was eighty-seven percent successful in trapping the plastic particles. And that's thinking outside of the box. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. It's also, I think, eighty-seven percent successful in a project like this is that's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. good success. Well, for what it's worth, microplastics are fragments smaller than five millimeter. Five millimeters. And come from the production, the products we use. Yeah, five okay. millimeters is almost a quarter of an inch. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, they have been found at the bottom of the world's deepest ocean trench and lodged in the Arctic sea ice. It must be, must be uh, 
Small, must some of them I, get I'm pretty wrong small. About five millimeter. I think they're smaller than that. Well, well, some, because of their tiny size, microplastics are able to pass through fix, filtration systems. Yeah, five millimeter sounds large. Well, and you, but it might be correct. 0.5 would make sense. 0.5 would, you know, make more sense. Anyway, they. In any is, case, just small. These things are a huge <laughs> problem, because fish eat them and. In some cases, they they lose their. Well, they're all over the food. ocean now, and they shouldn't be there because we keep throwing stuff out that winds up in the ocean, and the ocean breaks it up into small particles. There's and they're there. A lot of work on trying to figure out a way to get rid of these, including ways to have them back uh, broken down by um, bacteria. Bacteria, or there are certain things that. There are bacteria that live in the digestive systems of various insects and worms that will... And people. And people <laughs> that will eat these things. So maybe if you get the right bacteria in them, you could swallow your toothpaste and eliminate them that way. <laughs> okay. We've got another picture coming up We here. do. And this is one that Tom likes. I like. And it's... This it's is a very interesting Kind of picture. fascinating. Very interesting picture. Those things that are hanging from that tower, by the way, are... Boxes concrete full of, blocks. Yeah, they're they're blocks of concrete, and they're heavy. There's there's no no question about that. Well, on this show several times I've mentioned a very primitive form of energy storage where you use one crane, a portable crane, a tra yeah. you know train on wheels. You pick up these blo these blocks and you lower them when you want to. Well, this but this is, has got it. Yeah. Made into a machine. Oh, yeah. And another thing, too, that is similar to this is that business of running trains up train tracks. And you have running carloads same of, thing. Car loads of stone. A primitive way of doing things, yeah. but it works. Okay. Um, this article is from PV Magazine. What do you have for a title for the Funding article? for gravity-based renewable energy storage tower for grid-scale operations. Yeah, Energy Vault, maker of the EVX Gravitational Energy Storage Tower. That's what has, you're looking at. Has secured $100 million in Series C funding. The investment was led by Prime Movers Lab with additional participation from SoftBank, Saudi Aramco, Helena. Aramco. And, Aramco, yeah. Helena and Idea Lab X. And these are not insignificant organizations. Softback is big, and Saudi Aramco is big. I'm not familiar with Helena. Well, Saudi Aramco is very big. I yeah, mean, these it was are big, big before the Saudis. Huge. The Saudis took it over, so it's now it's owned by the royal family. Oh, of course. And I lived there. Yeah, and it was big. Yeah, big then. And if you if you distributed it evenly through the whole Saudi royal family, you'd have thousands of people, oh, each with a no, tiny. Oh, it's only the chunk. royal princes. <laughs> There's only about seven of them. Oh, the seven important <laughs> Saudi princes. Well, they call them royal princes. Oh, I see. They're the royal princes. The I rest of them known. are just princes. Just princes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Do you have more on this? Yeah, this EVX is a six-arm crane tower, as you can see. It lifts large concrete blocks using electric motors. And you don't have to worry about balancing because you lift two blocks at the same time. Yeah. One on either side. Crafting gravitational energy. Yeah. Creating as So crafting. here you can store energy and not worry about cobalt or lithium or any of that stuff. And they don't have a shelf life. They're up there and they stay there until you need them. Absolutely. <laughs> and you don't have to dam rivers. Another innovation, and this, this is this is a... A different way of looking at it is iron air batteries, which use iron pellets exposed to oxygen to create rust. Yeah. Who to thunk? Who to thunk? <laughs> the oxygen is then removed, reverting the rust to iron. There's some pretty clever people out there. There are, yeah. Okay, our next item is from the BBC. And, and we are another, talking about another heat pic waves. Another picture up there. Another picture. It's called heat wave, as you already said. Yes. Europe's 2020 heat reached a troubling level. Last year was the warmest on record across Europe. It was the warmest on record in a bunch of places. In a bunch of places. Yeah. <clears throat> Breaking the previous high mark by a considerable amount, say scientists, temperatures in the region were more than 1.9 degrees Celsius above the long-term average of, 18, of 1981 to 2010. Also, Arctic temperatures were, in the highest, were at the highest 
since records began in 1900? Well, Earth's greenhouse gases were the highest on record. Yeah. Okay. CO2 levels were the highest recorded in ice cores dating back as far as 800,000 years. <laughs> Global sea level was also the highest on record. So we're doing some things that we got to stop doing. Yes. Yes, indeed. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, Friday, August 27th, and we got a picture of a guy with some quinoa. Quinoa. You can buy quinoa at the co-op. Oh, I, 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 I eat quinoa. Do you? I got these little cups, and they're little quinoa things with onions and carrots chopped up in it. Oh, really? And they even provide a little, little wooden spoon. Oh, really? So if you're looking for a real quick snack, just open one of these things up and uh, you're set for a couple hours. Wow. And the quinoa, is sort of, it's sort of like pastina. It's, it, sort of, it's, it's like the, uh, well, I, guess, I guess you'd call it macaroni, pastina. Oh, okay, pastina, the little it's, tiny pasta. Little, and this is very much like it, except it's natural, it's a plant. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so there's a picture of quinoa growing in the Dubai desert. And Dubai do have desert, don't they? Yeah, and don't also quinoa, apparently, it's very uh, tolerant of salt in the water that you give it. It is. That's one of the reasons why they, they're growing it there. Yeah. So you have a title for this thing? The center in Dubai is growing future-proof food in the desert. In the Dubai desert, farmers must contend with intense heat, limited fresh water, and sandy soil. Here, the International Center of Biosaline Agriculture is transplanting and growing salt-loving superfoods in an effort to expand food diversity in the region. Well, Dubai is, is part of Arabia. It's, a yes. part, it's not Saudi Arabia, but it's, it sticks out from Saudi Arabia like right. a nose. It's one of the Gulf states. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the world's driest places are boosting food production by introducing plants that thrive with less fertile salt and seawater. Right. Duh. <laughs> Such as quinoa, which comes originally from South America. Interesting. Farmers in more than 10 countries are already producing the crop used for food production and possibly as a biofuel. Well, there you go. There you go. And that's what it looks like. A biofuel. Well, it looks like whether you want to eat it or it use it. It looks like some kind of weed that you'd pull if it grew up in your garden. Well, it's got a lot of seeds on it, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah. Let us move along, you and I. Okay. We have an article here from PV Magazine. We've got a picture of... Is that... Are you ready for this? <laughs> it's a solar array. Oh, by a golly. Big one too. Who would have guessed? Okay. Big, look, look at those guys down there, how small they are. Huh? Yeah, well, the solar panels are probably five feet long. Or more. They're big guys, yep. Yeah, they're big. They're not these little ones you put in your uh, top of your doghouse. Yeah. So, what do you have for a title for the article? Well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta bring that up. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm using the wrong mouse and it isn't working. Well, it's what happens when you use Australia's the wrong mouse. largest planned renewable zone is swamped with 34 gigawatts <laughs> of capacity. <laughs> A gigawatch is gigawatts, so 34 <laughs> they gigawatts got 34 is a lot. Of them. This is a lot of stuff. Okay, uh, Australia's newest planned renewable energy zone has been swamped by investors, according to the New South Wales government. It revealed that 34 gigawatts of new solar wind and energy storage projects have been proposed for the 8 gigawatt site. Now, I got to tell you, 8 gigawatts is a lot. I mean, that's... Well, if you want to see what... Uh Five megawatts looks like you go up to Ferry Road, and it looks like a lot. Yeah. And eight gigawatts. Eight is gigawatts is a lot. Considerably and more than five megawatts. Right, and the sun doesn't always shine, so eight gigawatts of solar is going to be producing about as much electricity during the course of a year as maybe, I'm going to say 1.5 gigawatts of nuclear power, 1.6. I something. think it's even more than you that. You think? Yeah. Okay, think but nevertheless, this is the equivalent of a couple of nuclear power plants oh, that definitely. they're looking for, definitely. and they wound up getting and they more than... they don't have to buy fuel. Yeah, and they, they wind up getting, instead of eight, which is a huge amount, they get 34 proposed. 
So they're talking about a lot of people wanting to build solar power out in the desert. And well, it's not quite desert in Australia. Well, when you look at Australia, you go more than 50 miles inland from any place. You got desert. It's almost all of central Australia the central is desert. Part is, is almost all desert. Yeah. There's only one exception to that, and that is that there's mountains right in the, right in the exact center. Yeah. Um, there's mountains that run kind of parallel with the East Coast, and they tend to be kind of green, even though they're mm -hmm. 100 miles or something mm -hmm. inland. But Well, it's interesting because this area is called New England. Yes, it's <laughs> called New England, and it doesn't look much like New England to me. I think they were probably, this is like the, the who was it, who called Greenland, Greenland? Um, yeah. <laughs> and he wanted people green to move land. there because it was green, and it, yeah. there wasn't much green there. Well, Just a is, little little corner of it in the south. Yeah, right. This is um, this is New England, and it doesn't look like New England that I've ever seen, and it doesn't look like England either. Well, they're planning to make it a part of a renewable energy zone. They're doing this same thing in other places in Australia. Right. So they're falling from behind and falling ahead. Yes. Okay. They know what they're doing. We have a picture of a Tesla Model Three. I think we do. We do. I think we it's do. It's up there. Te and we have an, uh, an article from Clean Technica. I found this article really fascinating. You did, didn't you? I did, absolutely. <laughs> what do you have Let's get the car up there again. Yeah. Okay. Tesla is slowly cutting into pharmaceutical and health insurance costs. Huh? What? <laughs> Tesla doesn't make medicines or cure diseases but it's having a growing effect on the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry here in the United States. Asthma, COVID-19, and dementia have all been shown to be made worse by air pollution. And of course, Tesla is building cars that are not polluting. Correct. There's no exhaust coming from a Tesla car. Yeah. Well, fine particulate air pollution is the problem here. Yeah. And it comes from combustion. Yes. Okay, and it can interfere with the work of the lungs. Yeah, absolutely. Which is what this article is all about. Yeah, which means you can have all kinds of different um, health problems that result. And you know, this, is, this has been known for a long time. I've talked about this for years Oh now. yeah. Um, the, the American Lung Association in, in California did a study of 10 states, one of which was Vermont, and they, they found that in Vermont we spend about $300 million a year on, on health problems that arise from the use of fossil fuels in And we don't have to. <coughs> yeah, we don't have, you know, we've got these electric cars coming, and the sooner we get rid of those um, old combustion cars and replace them with electric cars, the sooner we're going to have good fresh air that isn't killing people. Well, one way or another, the people <coughs> are paying for this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, even if it's just the, the cost of your health insurance. Well, the people who have emphysema or, or chronic bronchitis or asthma or lung cancer, they know that they've They're, got health issues absolutely. that are costly that um, that are affecting their lungs. So basically everybody's paying for it because of the rise of cost insur for insurance. Insurance and also the cost of of, uh, of um, taxes that have, you know, in some places you've got people who are disabled and they're supported to a certain yeah. extent by tax money. <coughs> Pardon me. And it can be very disabling. It can be indeed. And um, so there you have it. And we get a nice picture of a ship here. Yeah, this is the Yara Birkeland. Which That's is, what it is. And this particular item comes from <laughs> CNN. Well, this is, this is kind of amazing. It's the world's first crewless, zero emissions cargo ship. Yep. And it will set sail soon in Norway. Yeah, now I have a question. Hope if, I got an answer. If somebody's out in the middle of the ocean on a, on a raft yelling and screaming for help is the in, is the um, is the artificial intelligence feature dr driving the ship going to be smart enough to stop and pick them up good question <laughs> my bet is that it won't be okay well there's a lot of pictures in this article it's a yes. good article to look at if you like pictures yeah i had to i had to f figure out which picture i wanted to use 
There were some pictures nice that I picture. liked better than this, but I didn't like the way yeah, they were nice on picture. television. So you have a... World... You, I think well, you I said that, that already. Yep. Yara International, a Norwegian company, has created what it calls the world's first zero-emission autonomous cargo ship. The ship is to make a journey between two towns in Norway with a reduced crew on board to test the autom autonomous systems before the end of the year. Next well, this year, ship is capable of carrying 100 containers. Yeah. Okay? The top speed of 13 knots, which doesn't sound like it's fast, it'll use a 7 megawatt hour battery, which has about 1,000 times the capacity of one in an electrical car. Mm -hmm. So it uses a pretty big battery. It's got a pretty big battery. So they're going to charge this thing on the quayside before sailing, and then back again. And when it gets back, they'll recharge it. Recharge it. It's, it replaces forty thousand truck journeys in a year. Oh my God! So this is really effective in saving energy. Yeah, yeah. And, and they say that initially, loading and unloading a ship will require. Are you ready for this? Humans. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, all loading, discharging, and mooring, op mooring operations, including berthing and unberthing, will operate autonomously. And you know what is going to happen? We're going to wind up in a society that has no workers. And then we all sit around <laughs> on a beach drinking pina coladas, <laughs> except for a few of us who write poetry. Who don't like pina colada. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> we got an interesting picture coming up here. Of Queen Elizabeth. Da, 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 is that, is that what She that always is? has a nice hat, you know? Is she, <laughs> she in the royal She's family. She's 95. She looks pretty good for 95. Yeah, she does, doesn't she? The royal family has always been big on hats, or at least during my lifetime it's been big on hats. She's well, an interesting woman. Do you know, she, she, she... Said, she worked in the army during the Second World War. In the army? In the, well, she was in the military during the yeah, Second okay. World War. And she said that her, her mother was, got very upset because she insisted on talking about spark plugs. <laughs> because she had been learning how to repair truck engines. Is that what she was doing? In, she was in a regular army then, huh? She was, I don't, it was the women's equivalent. Yeah, I don't know what like, that. Well, in America, it's the Women's Army Corps. Wax. Yeah, well, it, which now it's regular army, and in Britain, it's now it's regular army too. But she drove trucks and yeah. you know did whatever. Did what she had to do. Young woman, and uh, and as queen, she could have avoided all of that stuff. Well, she was only a princess then. She was just a princess. I don't know. You know, the the royal family has got more inhibitions on their freedoms than you can possibly imagine. If you talk about politics as a member of the royal family, that's treason. Is it really? Just talking I'll about politics. I'll okay, so what do, you, what do you got for a title for this? Well, Queen Elizabeth II, QE2, <laughs> will attend UN climate change talks in Glasgow. Yep, this is from CNN. Queen Elizabeth II will attend a pivotal UN climate change conference in Glasgow this fall, giving a royal boost to the event, according to a tweet from organizers. The UK is hosting global leaders for nearly two weeks of talks in the Scottish city from October 31st to November 12th. I wonder what it's going to be like. My daughter uh, went to the University of Glasgow and okay. got her doctorate there in philosophy. Wow. And she married a guy who was um, a, uh, is now a professor in the medical uh, department. He had been a lecturer at the time that they met. And um, so they live just outside of Glasgow. And uh, I wonder what that's going to do to their lives, having these foreign people and then zillions of, of uh, security people to make sure nothing goes wrong and traffic jams and you name it. <laughs> I see Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm reminded of, being, of an event that happened to me in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. I stumbled into a bar, <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to be in there was the crew of the Queen Elizabeth II ship. Okay. And boy, we had a great time. <laughs> um, I believe it. Good guys. Good bunch of guys. I don't know if she had anything to do with the QE2, though. Huh? 
I don't know that she had anything to do with the QET, aside from the fact that it was named for her. I don't think she had anything to do with it. Probably no, nothing. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Well, let's see. The event is happening against ah, yes. a backdrop of series of extreme weather events across the oh, Northern yeah, Hemisphere, which I we guess. just had. Yeah, and the Southern Hemisphere. It's just, you know, we, we flip. We flip. Yeah, we just, we, just, we, just, in the north? we just had a pretty severe weather event, but it happened at night and nobody noticed. Which was? Rain. You mean here in Brattleboro? Right here. Yeah, we there was a lot, lot of rain, rain last night. night. Yeah. I, I took mean, all my uh, little citrus trees and put them on the porch so they wouldn't get drenched. Wouldn't get drenched. Yeah, there's, there's puddles all over the place. And by the way, our fig trees are producing figs. Lots good, and good. lots and lots of figs. Well, I'll take a Well, few. with the amount of water that we've had, you know, this summer, the figs are huge, very watery, and not as flavorful as they might be. Oh, well. Oh, well. Can't have everything. Yeah, we had, you know, but that's our figs. And we have more fig trees and lime trees and, and lemon trees and such what that, than you can shake a stick at. Well, we got a picture of a truck olives coming too. up. Olives, too. We have olive trees, and they're producing olives. A truck. And oh, yes, this is Rivian. And I was just telling Elena downstairs in the office for the BCTV about Rivian because this is an amazing story. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. What do you got? For a Rivian time? aims for $80 billion valuation in, an, in their initial public offering. $80 billion in an IPO. That's, just, that's a lot of money. I got news for you. That is more money than the ca market capitalization of Ford, GM, and, and Fiat Chrysler put is together. It really? It's unbelievable. The only car company in the, United, in the history of the United States that was, that was bigger than that as an IPO, actually, probably well, If GM you look at that picture, that it looks like a normal pickup truck. Except for the headlights. Except for the headlights. And the lack but of a grill. But this is interesting. It's got a trunk. It's got a trunk. Where there would be a motor, there's a trunk. It's called a frunk. A frunk. It a is frunk. called a frunk, as it a matter is. of fact. That's right. Okay. And, you know, it's like these guys are going to market looking for $80 billion. It used to be that $80 billion was a lot of money. It was at one time, wasn't it? It was, yeah. <laughs> I remember Everett Dirk Dirksen. You remember Everett Dirksen? Yeah, I remember He Dirksen. was a senator when John yeah. Kennedy was around and so forth. I remember Everett Dirksen saying, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're up to some real money. <laughs> that, you must have heard the same thing. Either that or you're psychic and reading my name. Okay, we're up to Sunday. Well, let's no, fit, you we have got more a, about this? a quick thing. Okay. Rivian has a factory in Illinois. Okay. And it's considering one in the UK and another one in Texas. Yeah. It will, ha it will deliver 10,000 electric vehicle vans just to Amazon by the end of next year. They've already got the order. They got See, the order. See, that's the thing. They've yeah. never built a truck, but they've got an order for 10,000 of them <laughs> from Amazon. And oh as gosh. I mentioned already, electric pickups can have a lockable front trunk. Yes. Which is a big thing if you've got a pickup truck. You know, you Absolutely. Could, otherwise, you've got to leave your golf clubs exposed in the back, back of the truck. Well, you know, it depends because there's crew cab trucks and they, they yeah. you know, they've they, got, they got... They got space but, in yeah, there. Yeah, this is... Okay, we're up to Sunday, August 29th. There's another one coming up on Sunday and we, and we got a picture of, Tesla of some cars. Teslas, huh? Yeah. There are, they are Model Y cars for whatever that's worth. <laughs> and you can see they don't have grills. Well, that's, that's the giveaway. That's the modern thing is don't have a grill and don't have exhaust systems. And by the way, don't have gas tanks. No, they don't. Have you, you, I'm sure you have seen a car blazing brightly on the side of a road. I have. That's an impressive sight. Oh, it, yeah. It really yeah. is. The gas tank burns nice. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, you know, I've had that happen on a couple of occasions. Have you? Oh, For yeah. yourself? No, no, no. Oh, my oh, car. Well. But I've seen cars catch fire and burn brightly, and I've never seen it happen with a, with a battery car, but I'll tell you, gas tanks are not safe. Never have been. Don't keep never a happened. gas tank under your kitchen sink. No. It's not a safe not thing safe. to do. But we need them, so we got them. But yeah, they, well, we can get rid of them by using cars like this. What, what well, that's going to be happening no matter what we say yeah, here on the show. Okay, what do you have for a title? This is from the Clinton waiting Canada. list to own a Tesla is growing. Dun, sure da, da, da. Tesla's waiting lists are back. For most models, if you order today, 
you might be lucky to see your Tesla this uh, new Tesla this year. Tesla is predicting a wait of up to six weeks for Performance Model 3 and Performance Model X, but for some models, estimated delivery times can be as far out as April of 2022. They've well, got a neat little car that I haven't seen a picture of it yet. It's a two-door uh, sports car. Yeah. And it was supposed to be coming out this year, and it's not going to, they're putting it off for a year. Yeah. Um, by the way, April 2022, I keep reading things like that and saying, well, that, that's a long ways away. I got news for you. It's not. It's about a nine long months, huh? Yeah, it's, it's next. 2022 is next year. Well, April is nine months or so yeah. from here. And I, I yeah, will 2022 tell you, is next year. That's when I was sure. a kid, I did not expect to see the year 2022. I don't think I did either. <laughs> okay. So what's causing the delays? It's the same shortage of semiconductors in other parts that's plaguing every automaker. And T Toyota was recently forced to cut glo global production by 40%. This is serious, guys. Right. And GM, Ford, and Stellantis, who I don't never heard of. Stellantis uh, is Fiat Chrysler. Oh, that's Chrysler, huh? Yeah. Okay, good. They've announced temporary plant shutdowns. So this is, That's if, you, right. if you need a new car, you, you're going to have to wait not, for it. This is not a good market for them. It's a very good market if you want to sell a used car. Yeah. and You can get more a, than you paid for it sometimes. A lot of times you can. Actually, I've, I did that in the past. Have I you? Had, yeah. <laughs> in 1972, I had the funny idea in my head that we were about to have a gas crisis. Wonder why you would think that. Well, I can explain <laughs> it. It was because there was a blizzard in Iowa, and there was a city in Iowa where the 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 it, it wasn't on a railroad, and but it was a it was a fair sized city, but truck traffic in and out was stopped by the blizzard for several days. Okay. Every single ga uh, oil retailer and wholesaler in that city ran out of oil over a weekend. Wow. And I sat there, and this was in, in April, it was a weird blizzard, and I said to myself, wait a minute, that means all of the oil companies were not supplying oil. Sure it does. oil. Yeah. And you'd think that they'd be giving a little bit of a supply, but they've just converted everything to gasoline for the summer. Yeah. They must have a, have a shortage in their tanks that we aren't being told about. And of course, that fall, the United States backed Israel in, the, in, the, in one of its wars, and the, and the Arabs said, we're not going to ship oil to you, and, you know, anymore. And all of a sudden, we had this gas crisis, which started bef months before the last ships coming from the, yeah. the, uh, uh, the uh, Persian Gulf arrived in, uh, in the United States. We didn't see any reduction in deliveries, but we had a gas crisis. Yeah. Before the crisis, because I knew it was coming, I bought a TR3. A TR3? Yes. Nice little car. <laughs> it was a nice, yeah. it was used, obviously. Yeah. And I sold it for every dime I had into it, including insurance. <laughs> that was a neat little car. It was a neat little car. Well, anyway. it was, it, for what it's worth, in this article, there's a video. Yeah. And it's Elon Musk commenting on the chip supply surge and ongoing supply chain issues. Yes. And it's a good. It's actually a good video. I mean, Elon does a good job. He talks a little funny though. Well, <laughs> he's from South Africa. Yeah. Everybody in South Africa talks funny. It's just kind of the name of the game. Okay, our next item, and here I'm, I told a story, so we're behind schedule. Uh, next item is from Clean Technica. Space mission tests. N-R-E-L perovskite solar cells, and N-R-E-L is the is National the Renewable Energy Laboratory. Yeah, good. Thank you for telling me that. Their researchers are testing ways to bring down costs of terrestrial applications and transforming how PV technologies would work in space. Now, obviously, those two are related. Now, a test will evaluate the potential use of perovskite solar cells um, in space and assess the durability of, of materials used in those cells. Perovskites are really cheap 
and they've got huge advantages. The problem is they deteriorate rather fast in air. That's what they're working to fix. Yeah, and now they're working on it in a non-air environment here. Yeah. So they're working on things that don't wouldn't have much to do with anything in our backyards. I, th I think they're trying to build these things in space. They might. Okay, our next item is from um, is from um CNN, and it's about oh, we got a Hurricane picture here. Ida. We do, and uh, that's the path of Hurricane Ida, and of course, and it followed pretty much is, that path. It did. It actually went, I think, just a little, a little bit, bit north of the path that we we see there, where it looks like it would probably be coming out to see. Some. Well, it passed through Brattleboro last night and left a lot of water in its wake. Yep, and it. Uh, it was, as I said, a little bit north of what I would have guessed. It's sitting up off of uh, New Brunswick or Prince Edward Isn't Island right oh, now. Right. Wow. Okay, what do you have for title for the article? I don't know. I got a, I got a scroll this thing. <laughs> <laughs> projected path of Hurricane Ida. Well, it's no longer projected. Sunday, VPR, Vermont Public Radio, predicted 20 inches of rain. Woo. Man. Oh, it was 20 inches of rain in Louisiana. Yes, okay. Okay, because I didn't think we had that much what rain. What do you have for a title for the article? Louisiana hasn't yet recovered from two major hurricanes in 2020. Now, this is this Now, is another crazy. one is taking aim. Yeah, this is crazy. Five named storms struck Louisiana in 2020. Two of them were major hurricanes, doing a total of $18.75 billion in damages. As the state still reels from the de destruction, another major hurricane is now barreling toward the coast. So well, it's just barreled already. It got Laura, which was the really, really bad one yeah. last year. Laura was, I forget the name of the storm that hit in 1856, I think it was, but there are three storms that are tied for the strongest ever to hit Louisiana. One of them was that 1856 storm. The other one, second one, was in 2000. So we have a sense that maybe this is a 130-year event, 125-year event. And but it's now, happening one year later, we get yeah. another one. The this same is strength. This is and the this same thing, thing was the fifth strongest storm ever to hit the United States. And it hit on the anniversary of, of uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina. Well, there's 39 photos in this article, so if you like pictures... Yeah. There's quite a few pictures. Keep you busy for a while. Okay. I'm well, gonna... Laura made landfill in Louisiana as a Category 4. Yeah. And you don't get much better than a Category 4. There's there a is category a Category five. 5, and we have been hit by a few of them. Name, five named storms hit Louisiana in 2020. I've read that. So I think we should go on. You got more? I'm just trying to see it. Nah. Well, we no, have another picture of Hurricane Ida here. We're up to Monday, August 30th, and I've got an item. Well, let's get it up in. there so people can see it. Yeah, there you go. That hurricane is just about hitting it's Louisiana. Just a, yeah, the, uh, to, to the... To in, the left, you can see New Orleans. Yeah, uh, up and to the left, and then to the, all to, the way to the left, you see Houston. Oh, that's Houston all the way over there. Yeah. And all the way up in the upper right, what is that? I think that might be Atlanta? Washington, D.C. Atlanta? I think it might be Washington, D.C. It goes that far. It's hard, I don't know. Hard, hard I, I tell. can't tell. I mean, if I sat down with a map, I'd get it. But here, the hurricane is In about any case, it's Louisiana. Hurricane Ida. So we have this from CNN. Hurricane Ida forces the Mississippi River to reverse flow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Ida made it's going backwards, folks. Near Fort Fouchon, Louisiana as a, hurricane, a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 150 miles an hour. You know, I don't care how many snacks I eat. I think I could blow away in that speed. <laughs> um, I think you could The too. storm surge and strong winds actually caused the flow of the Mississippi River near New Orleans to, uh, New Orleans to reverse something the U.S. Geological Sur Survey says is very unusual, extremely uncommon, actually. Well, the river reversed from two feet per second south yeah. to about six inches per second north. Ugh. Wow. Amazing. Ida, which, or maybe is Ida who, arrived <laughs> on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Okay. Has tied Louisiana's most powerful storm ever. Yeah. Okay. Our, our next item is from The Guardian, 
What I'm trying to well, catch up. We got a up funny on. looking thing here. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. that's the world's first floating wind, wind turbine. It's being towed out to sea there. What do you have for a title for the article? Floating wind turbines could open up vast ocean tracks for renewable power. Yes, they could. In the stormy waters of the North Sea, 15 miles off the coast of Aberdeenshire in Scotland, five floating offshore wind turbines stretch 574 feet above the water level. The world's first floating wind farm, has, and it has already broken UK records for energy output. These, these wind farms, the, when you get out to sea, they're exposed to winds, and they wind up having capacity factors that are really kind of approaching pretty close to those of uh, natural gas baseload power plants. Well, it's, <clears throat> it's the coming thing, really. Yeah, it is. And, uh, this article explains most offshore wind turbines are anchored to the op ocean floor via fixed foundations. Yeah. They sit on the ground, in other words. That's, yes. Limiting them to depths of about 165 feet. Yeah, which is pretty but deep it, for that. But if they float, that you limit can is put gone. Them anywhere, put anywhere. Them anywhere. As long as you don't have to worry about ice or, you know. Well, like in that. the deeper waters, the winds tend to be stronger. Yes. So it makes a little yes. bit of sense. It sure does. They're especially suitable for the U.S. West Coast, where waters are mostly too deep for fixed platform we, turbines. Our, our continental shelf on the East Coast goes a long ways out. Yeah, and, but not know, on the West Coast. Not on the West Coast. But this Coast. is saying, so what? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Currently, less than 1% of U.S. offshore capacity floats. Less than what? 1% of offshore capacity. I got capacity news for you. Floating. We don't have any. We've only got seven, out, uh, seven offshore turbines. And they're well, all. That's less than 1%. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's 0%, which is yeah, less than 1%. It's actually 0 0.7. 0 0.7. No, 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 no. That's no. what the article said. Well, the article's wrong. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Okay, maybe I'm wrong, but if I am. I will apologize when somebody comes and says, you! Well, we got a nice picture okay. of some more. Of what more are these things, turbines, huh? Yeah. And this is from the National. And it's a picture of, are you ready for this? Holy smokes. Wind turbines. That again. Non-hydro renewables to have 72% of the power capacity growth by 2030. Fitch Nine says. Nine hydro renewables yeah. taken off. Non-hydro renewables, which refers largely to wind and solar power, will account for 72% of the global capacity growth between 2020 and 2030 amid efforts to rapidly decarbonize the global power systems. Fitch Solutions projected, and you know, I just said that the last article was wrong. I think Fitch Solutions is wrong. I think that it's going to be a, a fair amount more than 72%. I think you're probably right. I think it's going to be well over 80%. Well, there will be a continued decline in support for thermal projects. Yep. And a rise in renewable generation. Yep. Duh. Yep. Coal, in particular, is facing severe backlash. Yeah, Sell your well, coal socks, guys. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> As the world races to meet the Paris Agreement. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, August 31st. And, and we, got we have a picture here a picture of here a from car Clean Technica getting a a, a, uh, a picture isn't from Clean Technica. The article's from picture Clean of Technica. a car getting refueled. Refueled. Yep. Charging an EV. It says. That's what it says. What do you have for the title? For Keep the fuel dollars local by switching to EVs. It Im comes from Clean Technica. Yep. Important. A study shows that the U.S. Southeast consumers spend about ninety-four billion dollars on fossil fuels annually. Of this month, money, about $64 billion, leaks out of the region's economy every year. A switch to EVs powered by local renewable energy would retain this within the region, and that is a boon to the economy. I want you to think about something. Vermont ships about a billion dollars a year out of its economy to pay for to fossil pay for fuels. Fuel. If we had our, if we had our, our energy local... Wind farm, that's, solar That's power. just what this next sentence says. Yeah. Electrical vehicles that source electricity locally yep. keep transportation expenditures recirculating through local economies. Through the, how would you like to have another billion dollars in the Vermont economy? As they say in Flatbush, Wundheit. Yeah. Now, <laughs> of course, that billion dollars is more than just 
transportation. That's transportation heat. It's a significant amount. It's a significant amount, but and there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. Okay, we, we got another map coming. We up. have a map here which is scrunched down vertical. A little, little bit closer, a little, little closer to reality. Oh, it's gone by by now. It has gone by. Yeah, it's gone by by the time anybody sees this show. Anyhow, absolutely. It's well, it's already sunny out. <laughs> Okay, this is from CNN, and it, it does have to do not with that particular hurricane. Well, I'm going to put storm. that picture back up. Okay. And it is the rainfall potential of the storm. Yeah. And it shows us getting maybe it shows two to four us, inches. Well, we, we got a good amount of rain. I don't know how much, but there's a lot of puddles outside. There's a lot of puddles. Okay, I've seen worse, but, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah, but, from, you know, from, it's from still CNN. a significant amount. Right, from CNN. Climate change is making hurricanes stronger, slower, and wetter. Hurricane Ida checked all of the boxes. Human-caused climate change is making hurricanes more dangerous. We've talked about this and talked about this and talked Many about times. it. Many times. We can't they, talk about it enough because it's real. They produce rainfall, move slower once they make landfall, and generate larger storm surges along the coast. Hurricane Ida was a prime example of those changes. Basically, what it says is hurricanes are more dangerous than they used to be, especially if you're close to the shore. Well, there's a one-minute video on this website, and it's kind of scary. Yes. It really is. And uh, <laughs> I got a little note to myself here. On the radio, as I write this, rain could become heavy near the Massachusetts border. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens once in a while. Yes, it does. Okay, should we go on? Uh, yeah, we got stuff I could talk about, but I think we're running out of time. Okay. So let's uh, let's take a look at us. This is um, from the BBC. Hurricane Ida, a million people in Louisiana are without power. Yeah, Louisiana residents may be in the dark for weeks as officials take stock of the damage from Hurricane Ida. Ida made landfall on Sunday with 150 mile per hour winds the strong, fifth strongest ever to hit the U.S. mainland. About one million local people are without power. And guess what? They're having a heat wave now without any electricity. Without any electricity. There's a lot of pictures on this, and there's a pretty scary video <laughs> about storms, you know, about what this storm's doing. So if you want to be scared, it's a little early from Halloween, but... Uh, Take no. a look at this video. I don't like being scared, but you it's know. It's going to be difficult, a difficult life for quite some time. And there's some pictures of Hurricane Ida lashing the Gulf Coast. Now you're talking about difficult in Louisiana. In Louisiana. Well, the thing, yeah. The thing that's bothersome about this is if you consider the Gulf Coast, it starts at Texas, it goes across Texas, all Louisiana, the way to Florida. and it goes down the, down the west coast of Florida, all the way down to the Keys. Yeah. And then you've got the east coast of the United States, and that got is a little bit of Georgia from there. From Florida all the way to... South Carolina. Well, really all the way to Maine. We get hurricanes in New England every once in a while. We yeah, got, we do. We got hit by one just a short time ago. Well, I lost a car in one. <laughs> I, you know, it was parked when, down on Flat Street and got immersed. Yeah, when Hurricane, it wasn't Bob. What was the hurricane that hit Long Island about 20 years ago? I about don't remember. 40 years ago. <laughs> we'll I, call it Bob, just. No, it wasn't Bob. It was after Bob. It was about, it was about I don't know when it was, but there Sydney. was Gloria. Gloria, it ah. It was Gloria. I remember Gloria. And I was on the last bus to leave the um, Penn Station bus terminal for Ooh. New England <laughs> and I was on the last bus to leave Hartford and I was on the last you know it was like it's just the last bus the last bus the last bus and that bus was you know it was bounced around on the road by the winds and well, if uh, you want to watch that, uh, that, that website you can see the wind you can see Ida blow the roof off a hospital Yes, I saw pretty that. Pretty scary. It's pretty scary. Okay, our next picture. Um, our next picture. That that picture was that. Our next picture is up uh, Wednesday, September first, yeah, and we have a picture of pollution. That is. Is that what that is? Yeah, in but China. Unfortunately, that's all pollution. That's not the that's normal. Right. 
water yeah. vapor you see coming out of the cooling towers. No, this is that's coming out of the stacks. stacks. It looks like there are cooling towers in the background, but there's nothing rising. Nothing around. you can see. And you know, well, read read the title, and we'll go from there. Jiangsu Nantong Power Station. Well, I'm talking about the tower, the title of the article. Too. China curbs coal-fired power expansion, giving way to renewables. Well, that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, in the first half of this year, the government of China has chopped newly approved tower coal-fired units by 78.8%, that's a big chop. It's a big chop. To 5.2 gigawatts. Well, they're finally getting with it. Well, they've been, they've been, dragging working, they've been working on this for, for years. But they've been dragging their feet. Yeah. They declared war on coal a long time ago, and that was the premier of China who said it, I think. Well, they, they had, had and still have a lot of coal. They have a lot of coal. As compared with the same period last year, the non-government environmental organization Greenpeace said this in its latest uh, research report. So China has been, you know, under Mao Zedong, the Chinese were constantly worried about being invaded by Russia. Yeah, they were. And yep. as a matter of fact, Russia invaded, you know, shortly after the Russian Revolution, which is how Outer Mongolia became Outer. Became Outer Mongolia. Yeah. And um, the Chinese had land taken away from them directly that became part of the Soviet Union, and they just didn't trust the, the Soviets at all. So Mao Zedong said, if you live closer to the Soviet Union than this river, and I forget which river it was, we will give you free coal. Can't beat that, can you? Yeah, well, <laughs> you, except for one thing, and that is the people were choking to death because of all the coal that was yeah. being burned. So they've been they've been heavy on coal for a long time, and it's going to be not well, all that it's easy. Fifty percent of the country's total. Yes, that's right. Okay, should we? You have more on that? Not really. Okay, that was from Upstream Online. That's what it says. And now we have this oh, weird we a nice picture, picture here of um, something from Clean Technica. That's thermal energy storage. Well, this is an interesting thing because they're using sand. To store energy. Yeah. And I mean, you, I, I, let's take a look at how it works. We've I mean, we've got so many we've got so many many technologies in front <laughs> of us to choose from. The difficult thing is what to choose. Well, they take it sand and it goes all the way up to the top where they heat it up very high. Yep. And it goes into these silos which are insulated. Yes. So they just hold the sand there till they need it. Yep. Then they drop it down and the sand Boils generates water. generates steam. To run a turbine, yep. which generates generator, which goes out to the to the world. Yep, and then the sand goes back up to the top to get reheated. Pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. And enduring is just a word. I thought it was an acronym, but it's just a word. I, I thought it was an acronym. I anyway. They say uh, they. It, this is what it means. Economic long-duration electricity storage by using low-cost thermal energy. <laughs> Which is a horrible acronym. It's a bad acronym. It's not an acronym. Okay, what do you have for a title for the article? Using hot sand to store energy. Researchers at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory are in the late, late stages of a prototype testing a thermal energy storage technology that uses silica sand. I looked this up. Not all sand is silica. No, but most of it is. Most of it is. The junky sand that you get in deserts that is really lovely sand, but it's not good enough to make the <laughs> things that you want to make out of sand, that works fine for this. Um, as a storage medium, this, the system is a reliable, cost-effective, and scalable solution that can be sited anywhere. The sand is heated to 1,200 degrees Celsius, which is 2,192 degrees Fahrenheit. That's en hot. Energy storage. I used to be a kiln operator when I was in college. I worked oh, yeah? in a chemical factory. Yeah. You know, I would reach into the kilns to, to put in these, these um, uh, trays that we had with chemicals on them, little... Um, they were small kilns. They were small. They had, the, the door was about yeah. this big, you know, maybe three square feet. And the hottest kilns I worked with were 300 degrees below this. And those so kilns, these are pretty hot. 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, you're talking about white hot. And these things are 300 degrees hotter. 
They're well, it's hot. an interesting thing. I mean, who would have thought they'd be using sand to store energy? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I thought about this, and I thought, you know, it would be more efficient to store the energy in water. But the problem is the water would have to be pressurized. If you, it would have to be, it would have to be, uh, you know, super critical. It kept order... from freezing if it was in the right place. Yeah, well, that's true too. But the sand is is going to be easy to store, and you know, so it's very inexpensive. Very inexpensive. So it makes a lot of sense. It it does, yeah. I think that's the last item we've got no, to talk No, we've got one is more, and one more? there is the picture. You want to put that oh, picture Oh, there up? we go. Yeah, we got a devil there, don't we? We have a gargoyle. A gargoyle. Yeah. A gargling gargoyle. A gargoyle. And I want to tell you, this is from CNN, by the way. I actually touched a gargoyle once. Touched it and you with lived, my hand. You lived to tell the tale. Oh, huh? What is more cool than that? <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I went up to the top of Bell Harry Tower in Canterbury Cathedral, and on the way down, we were kind of alone, so we were able to sneak off in a different direction. And touch gargoyles. And we found a door, <laughs> and the door opened out into a rain gutter that was about two and a half feet cr across and three and a half feet deep. And we were there. That's a good, pretty, pretty good-sized grain Yeah, well, rain it's gutter. a pretty good-sized roof. And... And there was a gargoyle, and I actually touched it. And the gargoyle that I touched was much better looking than this one. This is oh, pull, disappointing. Pull him up again. <laughs> <laughs> so well, what it's do you, a classic gargoyle, that's for sure. It sure is. So what do you have for, uh, this is from CNN, what do you have Paris for? slams on the brakes and sets a 30 kilo, kilo, whoo, kilometer per, per, per hour. hour speed limit to reduce pollution. Yep. Authorities in Paris are forcing drivers to slow down, setting a speed limit on almost all city roads to reduce pollution and improve safety. But there are questions about whether this rule, which limits drivers to 30 kilometers per hour, which is 19 miles per hour, will actually reduce pollution. Will and it work? I don't think it'll. I don't think this will work. <laughs> no, I don't think this will work. Well, the hope is that the limit will put more people off driving altogether and encourage yeah, well, more walking. It might do that. Huh? It might do that. But it means that nobody's going to be able to drive in top gear. I mean, you're, we're talking about everybody being, being in second gear here. That means you're going to use well, a lot of fuel. Well, 20 miles an hour. I mean, you can, you can technically walk that fast. If well, you're I really... don't think you could walk that fast. Well, you could if you were on a bus. But... <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, it, you're, if you're talking about getting from place X to place Y and they're three blocks apart and it's walk or drive at, at, at 30 kilometers per hour, I think you're right, Tom. You could walk that fast. I think you could. Yeah, because you wouldn't have to get into a car and start it up and then wait for traffic so you could get out. No, this, this would make... This would make well, it's an experiment. We've got to see how it lasts. We'll see how it lasts. Anyway, that's, that's the our, end of it. We don't that's have the any end more of our stuff. Folks. So we're as, tell, suggesting to everybody that they have an abundantly rewarding week, which you can see right there. <laughs> and we Y'all will come back and see us, you hear? Bye, all. <laughs>